Okay, so it is July 15th, 2015. I'm Barbara Garrity Blake, and I am talking to Mr. Arnold Adams about his legacy as band director of the Marching Mariners at East Carteret High School. So, Mr. Adams, can we just start off with some general questions about where you were born and how you came to get involved in this world of music? Well, I was born in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, which is not too far from here. Huh. And uh, my aunt majored in music, and she was the only one of my grandparents who sent to college. So her deal was to teach me. And so she started me piano when I was in the third grade. And her husband had a trumpet, and he loaned me that, and I played in the band. So that's really why I started in music. I was her first, first piano student. Of course, we played Baby Grands together there at the end and did a lot of things together. She was kind of like my sister. We were about 15 years apart. That's so nice. Yeah. So did you major in, in music when you went to school? Yeah, I majored in music in North Carolina Wesleyan College in Rocky Mount. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of that college. I think I was the third class that went. Had a lot of doctors. Just about all my teachers were doctors. And they were getting ready to go to universities, and so... I really lucked into a real, real nice group of teachers. So what kind of work did you get uh, shortly after graduating from college with a music degree? Well, I only had one job. That was East Carter High School. Really? And I come down here and I took the job. And whatever I decide to do, I just do it. And so you need to go ahead and take care of it. You don't need to start moving from one place to the other. If it gets rough, you just figure out how to handle it and keep going. So. So what year was that? I moved down here in 1967. How about? And I left in '96, and I've been here ever since. So almost 30 years. Well, I taught almost 30 years, right? Yeah. So when you started, had there been a, ba a band at East Carter before? They had never really had a real band at East Carter. They would, they were seven members. They were taking band. Uh, that's that's what signed up. And uh, we started on those seven members. I started a beginner class of 50. And the next year we were marching with 48. Wow. And we kind of went from there. How did you get everybody up to speed so fast? Got to do it. It gets real sad going to football games and basketball games and no band and a record player playing for the majorettes. And you're just sitting there like, hmm, I'm director here. I mean, that's kind of kind of sad. So we had to get something going. Wow. So was there already a, a high interest in music, or did you have to kind of recruit and cultivate that interest? Well, down east schools had never really ever had band. Uh, they said someone taught them, but I went to Atlantic, and the only thing that ever happened in Atlantic was drummers, and they had some sticks they played on. They didn't know what a clarinet or a flute or, or any of that stuff really was. They called that long black thing with holes in it. And most of them knew what a trumpet was. They knew what drums were, but they didn't know what all the other stuff was. Yeah. And didn't have too many students there. Smyrna, we had more students there, uh, but they didn't have much either. And Harker's Island, I don't think they'd ever had a band there either. Right. So uh, we just sort of started off from the beginnings. Of course, back then it was real nice because... You could buy a clarinet for $147. I think now I hear they're over a thousand. Mm. But uh, it's just because I remember all the, all the beginnings. And I remember all my first classes, all my students, and what we did. And we played in the Atlantic uh, Auditorium there one time. That's where I had to have my classes. And uh, I had two trumpets and a drummer and a trombone. And we were playing so much we blowed out one of the light bulbs and the the sound frequencies broke the light bulb. It was an old light bulb in that auditorium. <laughs> Went and told the principal I was sorry, but I guess I hit a note and it blew the, blew the light out. <laughs> That's funny. So why did you have a class in Atlantic when you were at East Carteret? I taught all the feeder schools. Oh. And then I also taught the high school. I mean, I had a, I also come over and taught the Catholic school over here in Moorhead. I was teaching all the time. I didn't have any, any 
classes above the beginners because I was just starting off. I had very few seventh graders and eighth graders, mm -hmm. and we started six. So I had a, had a lot of time. And of course, high school, I only had seven. So it really wasn't a whole lot. So most of my work was done outside the high school. Okay. But now, my first high school band concert, uh, I had to recruit everything I could recruit because I couldn't do it much with seven. So I recruited my two brothers to come play from Rocky Mount. One played French horn, and the other one played trombone. Mr. Ralph Wade, the band director at uh, West Carter High School, he come over and played baritone for me. Steve Gordon, another director that worked at West, he come over and played tuba for me. But I, I recruited anything I could recruit just to get that sound. Yeah. Uh, I even paid a West Carter drummer to be there just so I'd have a spare drummer. And so he was there, and I paid him so much an hour to stand there to help me out because I just didn't have anything. I had to, had to make it work. Yeah. And you got to start off with something. And so the first concert, we didn't play too many numbers. The beginners played quite a few because they were ready. And I had a few soloists, and we played there in the East Carter Gymnasium. So that was the way we first started off. And it was happy to have 48 going down the street. But we did play going down the street, and we and I think we were, we were playing it by memory. It was only one song. We couldn't learn more than one song. That was all we could do. What was the song? I don't even remember. <laughs> it was in some little book I had found, and, and it sounded pretty neat. So we put it together and got down the street with it. Yeah. So you were also working in the Down East with the Down East Middle School students, which was great because then they would in turn stay in band, right. hopefully. I'd have them a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course, the program grew, and it got larger and larger and larger, and we added more and more directors, where I think I had had two directors under me uh, when I retired. But uh, East Carter it was, was kind of rough because that room was only made for 60 people. I put 250 in that little room, and they wouldn't give me any money for a band room, so I had to go get my band parents to come in there and yank all the risers out because we had to have enough room to pile all those people in there. With the risers, you couldn't put the 60 people in there, and I had to pack them double. So we took the risers out, repainted it, and refixed it ourselves, mm -hmm. so I could get all those kids in there. But they hadn't planned East Carter to have 250 people going down the street. That was just not the plan. But I like, I like big things. <laughs> yeah. And so we, we worked at it and tried to get it there. The reason we got nominated to go to the Rose Bowl is they were very impressed that we had so many kids in a school as small as ours. I mean, we had 28% of the student body was in band. Wow. And he said when you have something like that going, that was something they really wanted to, to hear come to California. So they were impressed. How do you explain the, the huge popularity of band in a place that never had band? I think the kids just really got interested. They I was told, and I don't know how much truth it is to this, but we, we were putting Beaufort and all down east together, and putting all those together was just a little different. A lot of the people are different all over down there. I got to love them all, so it's no big deal. But uh, they said the band helped pull all the people together in that particular school. And man, they just really went into it, and they really supported that band program. I had probably the best kids I think you could have ever had. I just lived at the right time. Mm -hmm. And the best parents that were willing to help. We didn't have computers and all this fancy TV stuff and fancy games and stuff. They enjoyed going to the rehearsals and doing the work and, and accomplishing what the band accomplishes. And they put a lot of sweat and a lot of hard work into it. So. Beaufort and the Down East communities, I guess, historically had had some rivalry through sports. Probably. So it must have been interesting to pull everybody together. Well, you take our county, it's about 80 and 90 miles across, and a lot of difference. People in Salter Path, they're a little different than people in Moorhead, and Beaufort, they're different than Moorhead. But each one of our communities are somewhat different. Doesn't mean they're bad, they're just different. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, some of them do more fishing, boat building, uh, whatever they get into. But uh, some people on Harkers Island have never left Harkers Island. They, they, they were born there and died there. Mm -hmm. And of course over there the parents build a house and behind them the children build a house. 
Behind them, the grandchildren build a house, and it's just a big row of houses, and they just don't really take off anywhere. I don't think it's done that way now, but back when I was started off teaching, that was the way it was. Yeah. They all lived right there together, and they didn't have bridges all around here either. Uh, you couldn't even get to Harkers Island there for a long time. They didn't have a bridge that got over there. They used to have a boat, a mail boat, that used to go to Atlantic, and there was no way to drive to Atlantic. You could only go by boat. There was no bridges. Mm-hmm. And all that, all that's happened probably in the last hundred years. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I rode wood bridges down there. I could see through the boards when I first drove down there. That's back in 67. And the bridge I went across Harker's Island, it was so little, you were afraid to meet somebody in 67. It was just a little narrow wood bridge that went to Harker's Island. Hmm. So that must have been quite a cultural experience for you coming from Rocky Mount to get immersed in some of these little communities. Well, it was, and I really wanted to meet the people and be with the people, and I spent a lot of time in their homes. I ate supper with a lot of them, talked to a lot of them. I mean, they were family, and, uh, and they still meet me like they're family, no matter where I go. I was going to move back to Rocky Mount, but uh, my family's here. My mother's still living at 94. I'd like to be where she's at so I could see her more often. But really, my family's here. Mm -hmm. uh, if I go there, all I'll know is her and my brother. And here, look what I have. And I've and I, I started kids every year and everywhere I go. Like I, said, like I had mentioned to you, uh, I had open heart surgery and one of my students handled my recovery. She asked the doctor, she said she wanted to do it. I went to Carter General and one of them handled me there in a room. And uh, she thought it was cool to to treat me like I was in Disneyland because I carried the band to Disney about seven or eight times. So she put me in the Mickey Mouse room and gave me a toy to play with. <laughs> but uh, kid, kids are kids, and I love them to death. We get my eyes fixed, and the lady that works over there, she was one of my majorettes. Uh, but anywhere I go, wow. they're, they're there doing something, and I'm proud of them, what they've accomplished in their lives. And a lot of them say band did help them do some of the things that they're doing. Uh, you have to commit yourself to ban. Mm -hmm. You have to give up a lot of things to do ban. And they were willing to give that up. And later on in their lives, they realized that what they gave up, they learned something greater than that. It wasn't the music. It was just the commitment of doing something together to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. And they realized that's what paid off. So what were some of the, the um, high points of your, your career? Well, I was sitting by TV there one, one Christmas, and, you know, we all think of things we like to do. They say, you know, you can do anything you really want to do if you make your mind up to it. So I was just looking at it, and I saw Macy's go across the screen. I said, boy, that'd be nice to do that, wouldn't it? And then later on, uh, when, when it was New Year's Day, I saw the Rose Bowl Parade. I said, boy, that would be nice to do that, wouldn't it? And then I thought about being grand champion and, and winning a great, great competition. I said, hmm, that might be nice to do that. So you go down and you start trying to figure out, how, how can I do that? What have I got to do? Mm -hmm. Most things like that, you've got to know who you're asking to let you go. And you also have to have a good band. You can't just have a good band and get in. And you can't just know somebody and get in. It takes both things to make this work. Mm -hmm. And so... I got to getting more used to the Macy's people. I got more involved with the Rose Bowl people. And all of a sudden, we got the nomination. But uh, it was a difficult nomination to get. There was a guy for the Rose Bowl that really wanted my band to march. He was determined. He tried everything he could. He'd be out cutting his grass, and he'd get a phone call, and he'd call me. But he was determined to get me there. Mm -hmm. And after a while, he called me. He says, you're coming. So uh, it was great. What year was that? We marched there in 1990. So we marched in Macy's in 85 and 95. I think it was, no, 87 and 95, I believe is right. Uh, they say most bands don't march it but once. We did march it twice. I know one band that's marched it three times. So, and they try to limit it. Of course, that one is only limited. You could only have 12 high school bands in Macy's, according to the rules they have. The one we marched in the Rose Bowl, they only allowed seven out-of-state bands. So we were one of seven in the country. That's going, going against quite a few bands. That is. Uh, 
and they pick them. You have to send them videotapes and all the stuff in order to get accepted. And they watch the videotapes and then they make their choices. So it just takes a lot of work. Did you have Miss Rosie marching with you at all that, all those? Or I had Miss Rosie all I could have Miss Rosie. She did a good job. First time I saw her, I just didn't know what she was. And then, then she just got my interest. And so then I talked to her a little bit more, and then I decided to put her in the front of my band. Wait, did she show up dressed as a mariner? She showed up at the football game dressed as a mariner. She wasn't there to be part of the band. She just wanted to be a mariner. And, of course, I think her son was playing football, and she just decided that'd just be kind of neat. But I didn't know who was inside that outfit. <laughs> I didn't know her. Yeah, wasn't even, was wasn't a even really, mask. I wasn't really sure I wanted to talk to whoever that was because I didn't know who was in there. But we got to be real good friends, and she marched in every parade we went in just about. Uh, she almost died in Wimbledon one time. It was so hot inside of that outfit. I mean, she was really, I mean, it was over 100 degrees. You try to wear all that stuff on your face uh, and inside that leather coat. Yeah. She finally got her something a little lighter to wear later, but it's still rough to wear what she was doing. But it did add a lot to the looks of the band having her go down the street. Uh, I think it really added a lot to us. And she marched too, didn't she? Oh, she did. She was cool. <laughs> that put that pipe in her mouth, and I mean, she looked like the real mariner. Yeah. <laughs> and and she, she did a good job. I wanted those letters to go across us, which I ordered in, in uh, California. I had to go out there and talk to the guy and teach, and, and, and I had to work that out for them to make those letters. And most of all the bands that marched in the Rose Bowl had those letters. What do you and, mean, and those letters? We have letters called, it's, it's called Mariners, and then on one side it has a, has a nice looking Mariner, and then on the other side it has, I'm trying to remember now what it was, and I can't remember now. But it looks beautiful going down the street. You have maybe 10 girls holding those letters and they go across marching in front of the band. Mm -hmm. And it just adds so much to the beauty of that. Yeah. So uh, I don't know where those letters are now, but we used to always have those letters go down the street all the time. Wow. Do you have these on videotape, your shows, your competitions? I have, I have all my shows on videotape. I have rehearsals on videotape. Uh, Got, got lots of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all on VHS. I need to change some of it over. Yeah. We made CDs of a lot of them, which uh, we made and offered to the kids. Any kids that really wanted a copy of their, uh, of certain years, I told them I would make them tapes of it, and all they had to do was contact me. And I can, all I can make them on now is VHS, but, yeah. but, I, but I copied everything we ever did and all the major shows. And so all I gotta do is stick a tape in and copy three hours or whatever they want and I can copy everything they were in if they wanted copies of it. Mm -hmm. A lot of them bought those from me too. I think I think it was $20 I charged them to, to make all the copies for them, put them all together for them. Mm -hmm. But if they ever want it, because there are machines that'll take those VHSs and turn them into DVDs if they want to do that. Oh yeah. So when you went to New York and places like that, how did you get the kids to all behave, these overnighters? I'm glad we didn't have cell phones. Uh, that would have probably really gave me a hard time. Yeah. And we didn't have, we didn't have it where you could uh, text people. That would have really killed me too. I couldn't handle that. So I'm, I'm glad we didn't have to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, I tried to handle all these kids like they were mine. I didn't take them like they were yours. Mm -hmm. I treated them like they were mine. I didn't want anything to happen to any one of them. And they knew I, I felt that, that strong about it. And they teased me and teased me and teased me. First couple of trips I went on, I didn't have chaperones. I ended up being the chaperone. Uh. And that was kind of rough on me. I had to sleep on the bus between the, the rooms. I put all the boys on the hill. No, I put all the girls, I put all the boys on the hill and all the girls in the valley, and I slept in the middle. <laughs> and I tried to watch them. And we had checked the rooms. And one room, the girl was missing. And we couldn't find the girl. I called the office and asked them, was the girl in that office? And the lady told me she was, well, she wasn't. But she didn't want to get the girl in trouble. Well, after a while, this guy named Philip Goodwin, and I know his name, he come flying down the hill on the right side. As he came down the hill on the right side, the girl went down the, up, up the hill on the left side. So he got my attention 
to punish him so she could get back to her room. Oh. Now they're smart. They're smart. They're smart. He was probably a Cedar Islander. Yeah, he was. He was. He was. <laughs> yeah, we know how those Cedar Islanders Oh, yeah. <laughs> but he hadn't done it. The girl hadn't done anything bad, nor he either one. They're just trying to help each other out. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Later on, I worked it out where I had one parent responsible for four kids. And they were to treat them like they were theirs. One of them was theirs. Mm -hmm. So they only had three to watch out for. Most of the time, they were friends of their child. And I told them if anything happened to those other three kids, they were going to have to talk to the mom and daddy of those other three kids. That I didn't want nothing to go wrong. And so every, it was one parent for every four children. Every trip I took. And I told all my kids to stay together. I did never want to see one walking by their self. Mm -hmm. And I told them if they were walking by their self, they'd have to walk with me the rest of the day until they could find somebody else to walk with. Mm -hmm. That I did not want one kid walking by their self. Yeah. Uh, but we tried to watch out for them. And I didn't want anything. But going from here to California with 26 airplanes and me worrying, I mean, if something had happened to one child, that would have really eat at me. 26 airplanes. But, but, but it would really eat at me. It really would. I couldn't yeah. handle it. Mm -hmm. But uh, we got all the way to California, and we got all the way back, and only one person really got hurt, and that was my mother. What happened? We went to Universal Studios, and she was walking in the night, and the bus had parked, and that little black thing that's supposed to stop you from running was in the total darkness. And she tripped on it, knocked out three or four of her teeth. Speed bump? She, yeah, she looked like, no, it was one of those, one of those markers, like you, you pull into a drive and you can't go any further. Okay, yeah. But she tripped on that thing and looked like she'd been in an accident. I had two doctors with me, Dr. W Dr. Brady Way and Dr. Salter. Mm -hmm. They come flying down there to her, and uh, Dr. Brady Way went with her to the hospital. And then they had to do all that. But now out of the whole trip now, that was the only problem I had with my mother. But I didn't give her a chaperone. <laughs> Did she like to go with you on these trips? She went on quite a few of my trips. Yeah. Uh, she went to the ones in Florida. She went to Macy's. She went to the Rose Bowl. Uh, she liked to go to all my competitions. She hasn't seen any of my performances now probably in 10 years. She just hasn't been able to do it. But she used to know all the parents and most of the kids. Uh, she's 94 now, will be 95 this year. Mm -hmm. uh, she has nurses around the clock in her home. Uh, she can barely walk with a walker, but uh, that's about all she can do. Yeah. And I call her every night, and we spend 20 minutes on the phone. And I tell her I can't drive there every day, but I can talk to her every night. Mm -hmm. And without that mother, I probably wouldn't be what I am today. Uh, that's about the greatest mother I could have ever had. Yeah. And I will say that for her. Something else I mentioned while we were talking too, uh, without the help of uh, Mr. Ralph Wade, now he was the band director at Moorhead City High School for years and years and years. And then when they started the new system, he went to West. Now he was Mr. the Mr. Band Man of Carter County. Mm -hmm. Beaufort didn't have anything compared to Moorhead at that particular time. And he had a super band. They marched in Washington, D.C., won first place there. They came down the street and he told me, and everybody came out in their pajamas and everything else and celebrated the buzzes. <sighs> and it was just something. But when I moved in here, he just seemed to put his arms around me, like he really wanted to help me. And every morning he called me on the phone, didn't get you up, did I? And he called me about 6.15. And no matter what I needed, he would help me. And he would work with me as my head, head man, and he'd work as my assistant. Now, he can do two things at one time. He could do it. But he would tell me what to do. Then he had me in charge, and I'd tell him what to do, and he would do it. But he was determined to make my band the, the greatest band he could make it. And he gave me every atti attitude he had and how to make that work. And without his help, I probably couldn't have done it. But, you know, a lot of us teachers have mentors that just really get in there and, and tell us things. Yeah. And you need to listen to them, because they know a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of good teachers in Carter County that are just super at their jobs. And they have helped other teachers when they come in. There's just something about them that just gets their interest and they want to help them. Yeah. And you need to let them help you because they know a lot.
Did you ever compete against Mr. Wade's band? No, no. <laughs> well, he quit. He taught the West Carter High School band there, I think, for one year. And then, then he got out of that type of thing. Okay. Uh, then Steve Gordon took over at that particular time. Mm -hmm. and of course, my attitude was Carter County needs to be good buddies and we don't need to have enemies. So my attitude was never to compete against West. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't think we needed that problem. We need to support each other, and we just didn't need to compete. So that was just not my plan. Yeah. So if Wes was going, I didn't. And we just sort of had an agreement from the directors. We just wouldn't compete. Now, we were in two different classes we might compete, but not the same class. Yeah, that's nice. And we did go to one parade, and we both won second place. So, how, how and, and, I, and I, I told him I didn't want to be in the competition because of my reason. So we went to Richlands, I think it was, and they gave both of us second place. Like a tie? Yeah. <laughs> so it was all right. <laughs> Is Mr. Wade still alive? No, he died quite a, quite a few ways back, but uh, yeah. but he was a nice fellow. Yeah, huh. They had a place in the museum they had dedicated for him for years, but uh, he would always say in my kind of way, Chevrolet Coupe or something like that, but he had little things he did, and, and if somebody messed up, he would... I don't know, just the way he would handle it, he won't mess up no more. Yeah. He just he knew what he was doing. Uh-huh. And he just didn't take any mess. So but, you you kind of dovetailed on him when he was at the end of his career. Oh, yes. And then he helped you. So he was probably teaching, what, in the 50s, the 60s? Yeah, back in there, yes. 70s, wow. But he did good. He knew what he was doing. Yeah. And he played trombone. He had a cello in his house. Now, his son was super too on baritone. He he did a super job playing baritone. He made all state the year the year I think I came down here. Uh, his name's Ralph Wade also. Oh. And I think he turned into a principal. I think he's retired now. Mm -hmm. But uh, but he's living in the county. He does a lot of painting on the side. He's come and painted my house so. Oh, that's nice. Um, when you first started, I imagine that a lot of the Down East kids probably had experience with music through the churches. Was that the case? At least Harker's Island, I know. Well, well, a lot of them, a lot of the Harker's Islands were singers and great singers and guitar players. And we had, we had it, was a, it was a band that was known from Harker's Island back in those times. And I'm trying to think, I don't know if I can think of the name of them or not, and right now I can't. Was it a gospel band or a rock and roll band? Probably more of a gospel band, mm -hmm. but I can't think of the name right now to tell you. Tell you. And, I, and, I, and I do know the band. They were real good. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if they already knew how to read music at all. I think they did. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I've got a, you know, when I took over the job at East Carter, the guy that had it the year before me, he said, you're not going to teach these kids anything. He said, they, they, they don't even know what music is. He said, I bought a, a stereo and put it there in the band room so they could hear it. Because they they're not smart enough to understand it. So he took all the money that, that the Board of Education gave him and bought a record player. He didn't buy an instrument or music. Huh. He just bought him a record player. Wow. So he came back, he tuned pianos. So he came back to tune the piano. And I think that particular year I was marching 40, I think, out in the street. He said, that's the most you're ever going to get. He said, I don't believe you got 40 already, but that's unreal. He come back the next time. He didn't say nothing. I had 150 out there going down the street. He didn't say a word to me. And that was the last we ever talked. Wow. But there was talent. There was talent in Beaufort. There was talent on the east side. There's talent here on the west side. It's just unreal, the talent that's in Carter County in music. Mm -hmm. And without it, I think the county would really be upset with it. So mm -hmm. I teach a lot of, of students from the west side down. Oh, do you? Because I'm teaching over here at St. Peter's. Um, some of them get private lessons from me. Some of them I start. Some of them I start in homeschool, and then they go to east, or they go to west, or they go to Croatan. But, I mean, I'm teaching in all three of those high schools. I've got them in all three bands. But I don't start them in those bands, but I did start them. 
So what do you teach? Piano, guitar, any instrument they have well, to play? Well, any, any instrument they have in the band, we do that too. Wow, yeah. That's fantastic. So you are still influencing the, the youth of Carter County. Well, that's what keeps you young. Yeah, yeah. I had two kids la this last year that uh, I've been teaching for a couple of years, and they were real smart kids. And uh, they did not want to leave. Their dad had been transferred. And last day, they were really sad walking out the door. And their mother emailed me back. She said, both of my kids were crying in the car Aww. as I pulled out of here. And my daughter says, can I go back and take one more lesson sometime later on? <laughs> but uh, I love that feeling. And when they learn that much and they feel that good about it. Yeah. Uh, and I run across a lot of good kids. Yeah. They really work hard and they really care what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So what did, what did band mean to the families, you know, when you were teaching at East? I mean, what, do you think that it had an impact on the, the families of Beaufort and Down East? I think it really pulled all those families together. They all really cared together. Mm -hmm. uh, they supported that East Carter band. And I think they became a closely knit family band of parents. They just, they really supported what we were doing. Uh, we went to the Rose Bowl and we had a, a party one night. And one of my nice fellows, his name is Jack Russell, he's dead too. But I thought the world of him. He was sitting there all primped up in his nice fancy outfit and his tie. And there's another guy sitting over there at the table, and he says, Oh, I just want to meet you. I'm so glad. I'm, I'm, my name's Jack Russell, and I'm from Carter County. And the guy looked at him, and he says, I'm from Carter County, too. <laughs> he was so proud. He was there and found out that guy was the same place. <laughs> but uh, he said that just tickled him. Yeah, that's funny. Did you have... Um so your students were both white and black. I get careless. Yeah. Do you I think, get do I you, get really tired of some of that mess. Oh, yeah. I, I was called from the Board of Education, and they wanted to know how many blacks I had in my band. And I told them, I said, you know, I don't know, and I don't really care, but I'll go try to count them for you. I said, I like blacks, I like whites, and I just don't have a problem. If they want to be a nice person in my band, I'll take them. And I just don't, I don't see the, see the big deal in here. Yeah. But I just wonder if that helped pull together the communities too, North River and Harker's Island. But and I didn't have nothing against any of them, and they knew yeah. that. I had black girls as majorettes. I think they twirled rifles. They were in the band. They were on the flag team. It didn't make any difference. And they were good. The boy named Joey Peterson, he played saxophone. He's one of my first saxophones. He was a black fellow. He took off and they commissioned the ship under him. He brought it up here to Moorhead one day for the seafood festival, I think it was, and told me all I had to do was just let them know I was there and he would escort me anywhere I wanted to go. Was that the Navy? Yeah, wow. but he was just proud of himself and I was proud of him too. Look what he had done. He's commissioned the ship. Gee. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but they're smart. It's a lot of them. I mean... Whites and blacks are smart. You just got to work for what you want. Yeah, that's right. And that's, that's all it's about anyhow. Yeah, yeah. So do you have any um, particular stories that stand out in your mind of, of the students or your experience together? Well, they always write me notes and stick under the door telling me I can go to bed. But uh, that don't work. I don't go to bed. That's when I'm, when I'm watching them at night in the hotels and stuff. <laughs> And they just sit there looking at me and say, why don't you just go on to bed, Mr. Adams? But no, no. <laughs> the only time I take naps is when they're enjoying themselves. I had a cat nap at Cats because I didn't ever see any of that performance because I have to sleep when they're enjoying themselves because at night I got to stay awake. Okay, so when you're doing something fun and you know everybody's fine, then you can nap. I, I can go to sleep. <laughs> and then when they get through, somebody wakes me up and we leave, so... Uh -huh. But i got to get sleep sometime. So have any of your other students um, gone on to have a career in music? A lot of them have. Mm -hmm. Like who? Um, Ricky Sabiston was one of my best drummers I ever had. 
when he marched as a drummer, he was so little, the drum almost hit the street. I think I marched him as a seventh grader. Now he's uh, he's the main drummer of the entertainers, and they play all over this this part of the country. Uh, and he's still a really a good drummer. Mm -hmm. Every time I I take a trip, I ask him where he's going to be, and he usually gives me a special seat and treats me up up to par. He was in Newport, for some time during this summer, and I went to see him while he was the pig picking. I think is what he was was there for. But he's always interested to see me. He's always just as nice as he can be. Uh, another one called Francis Pittman. He got his, I think he got his doctor's degree in piano. So that's what he has. Kathy Styron, I don't even know where she's at now, but she had played for the Grand Ole Opry and a lot of that kind of stuff. She's from Davis, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she was really, really good, too. But there's a lot of my kids have done it. I can't tell you all of them. I just, I know some where I can just tell you right off the hand. But, yeah, yeah. but a lot of them have done things in music. Uh, it's just amazing to me to watch a child that doesn't have it quite together and they get into music and they make something out of themselves in that music and they get proud of themselves in that music and how their whole life changes. And I see it happen all the time. And I guess that's why I'm still in it. Because I see some of these that come in here, and it, they just need something. Yeah. And then once they get proud of what they're doing, their whole life changes. Yeah. So those that try they take music out of the schools, they have no idea what they're fighting. That's one of the greatest things the schools have to offer. Mm -hmm. And if they, don't, if they take that out, then I just don't know what they're going to do. That develops a different part of the brain than anything else. That's part of your brain that's got got a little bit of extra education in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, when when you retired, did did something indicate to you that it was time for you to retire, or was it just a number thing? You said, "Well, it's thirty years, time to move on." Or? No, I passed out just before I made that decision at East Carter, and I just wasn't feeling up to par. And I got to thinking that I was going to die right there the next year or two if I didn't get out. I just couldn't keep doing the pace that I was doing. Mm -hmm. I feel like i got to do the best of what I'm doing. And when you feel like you can't do the best, then you need to let somebody else have it. Yeah. And I think I would, have, I would have died for sure in the next two years if I had stayed there. When the band's going down the street practicing, I run completely around that band all the time. you got to be pretty fit to do that. Yeah. And, and I did it. I wanted to watch the ranks, and so I would watch the whole band go. Then I'd run around, get back in the front, watch them go again, run around, get in the front, watch them again. And I just did all that stuff. And they were marching around the track one day, and there was a board laying out there. And I thought I could pick it up, and I lifted it up, and it came back down on top of it. Mm. And I couldn't get it off. <laughs> they laughed at me then. But I finally got it off, and I got off off the track. But, uh, you know, you think you can do things you can't do sometimes. Yeah. So, are you in touch with the band directors that have, you know, come since you at East Carteret? Well, I had talked to some of them. It, it started dropping there one time, which really bothered me. All the money that I had raised and all the all the stuff we had bought. Uh, one director got them, and he checked out the instruments. I didn't ever collect them back, and they're in the homes of those kids right now. I don't know what what, what happened. Told the superintendent about it, and the principal too, but. Nobody did nothing about it, but I had a pile of horns that just totally disappeared, yeah. and nobody cared. Uh, when the kids started dropping, the numbers started going down, and, it, and I went and talked to the principal, but there wasn't anything done about it. Uh, the one you got out there working now has probably done the best so far. She acts like she really cares what she's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, she's from a different age than I am. My opinions are different than hers doesn't mean hers are bad or mine's bad. I'm just from a different part. Yeah. And uh, she's done well. She's won trophies. And the people are loving what she's doing. So that's that's the main thing. But I think my time and what I did sort of kind of gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm teaching my, my kind in this home school. They still like what I like. I still play Brighter Side, which was considered the national anthem of the East Carter Band. Brighter and Side. Called Brighter Side. It's a great number. There's not a number that I don't direct that. My homeschool band plays it every year. Uh, 
and they enjoy that song. Uh, they, somebody threw the music away, and uh, they asked me for copies of it at East, so they wanted to play it again. So I had to go photo, photograph some more copies for them. But uh, I try to keep copies of things that I like. Some things I can't find, but I try to find them. But, can, you, uh, can you play a little bit of that on the piano before we tie it up? I don't know whether I could do that a or little not. Bit? No, I don't, I don't know how I it goes. It. Well, you're going to have to get a copy of that somewhere. Come on. <laughs> I tell you, about anybody in Carter County would know what Brighter Side sounds like. Just uh, about anybody. Really? Except me. Yeah, except you. <laughs> you ought to have been around when they played that. Well, maybe I was, but I just, like, it's not popping. Because I've, I've seen the Marching Mariners lots of times, but I'm just not sure. We, we played play. Brighter Side in the Rook. Let's see. No, we didn't play in the Rook. Yeah, we did. We played it in Disneyland. We played both Disneylands, mm -hmm. but we played it in, in Macy's. We played it in Florida. We played it, in, played it in seven different states. We escorted Santa Claus in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and they put live snow, not live, they had artificial snow on us, and we had to get that off the uniforms because we had a performance the next day. Uh, but they let, they let us lead Santa Claus in. We were the tail end of that parade, and I was scared to death to march in Atlanta but those people were the nicest of my band I have ever run across. Really? They were just super nice. Why were you scared? Well, you just figured marching in Atlanta, you know, that's it's just like a, a big city. It sounded a little, a little dangerous to me. Yeah. I don't know why I wasn't scared of New York, but they got so many cops standing along the sideline there. I, I don't think you got a problem there. Yeah. But Atlanta was just one of the friendliest places I've ever marched. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. So you had band boosters. Oh, yes. The parents. And they raised money for those uniforms? They raised money for everything we did. We wanted to get people to come in here to teach these kids. We had to, we had to uh, pay for air flights for one of the main instructors to come in here to teach them. And we, we had some of those on Sunday afternoon. It was the only time we could get him to come in. And we'd go out there and we'd practice on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> and he would, he would give us the commands. He wrote, he wrote the show. He was also a music writer, too. But, uh, what was his name? And I knew you were going to ask me. <laughs> and I know it just as well as my own name right now, but I can't tell you. It'll come back. Oh, gee. Well, in the meantime, how did the parents raise the money for these things? Well, they had the idea of selling shrimp burgers, and I thought that was the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But they went down there on Front Street and made shrimp burgers, and I was amazed at the money they made. And then they started making shrimp burgers for the seafood festival. And they made, I think they made something like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 during the seafood festival. Now, how they made all that money, I don't know. But they didn't buy any of the shrimp. It was all donated by fishermen. Oh, yeah. And so everything was made was profit. And they went and built a trailer to have down there. And they opened it up and had a stove and everything all in it. I've had many a shrimp burger from them at the seafood festival. So they, they made a lot of those. Why did you think it was a stupid idea at first? I just couldn't think you'd sell a shrimp burger. We had a clam bake, which I thought was a, was a crazy thing when somebody suggested it. Well, you can have a clam bake and you can sell the place for $6. Who's going to pay $6 for a clam bake? And that's back in 67. That's not like a lot of money to me. And they give you, you ever had a clam bake? Mm hmm Well, you, get, you have the clams. And then you have the carrots and the potatoes, the onions, the half a chicken. All that stuff's got to go in that bag. And I mean, we really salt it and we really pepper it down. And then we had to go to the clam house and have them cooked. And then we had to haul them in containers back to East Carteret. Where was the clam house? Uh, that, that's in uh, Williston. Yeah, the old clam house. That's the old clam house. That's where they used to make the, the clam chowder. Uh, the guy that used to work there, I'm trying to think of his name, Elmer. Yeah, he was a... Uh, he was called the Clam King, the I Clam think. The Clam King, Elmer Willis. And he, uh, we buy our clams from him, and back then I think it was like a, a penny and a half or something. It wasn't a lot of money, but to me it was a lot of money. So I went in there after one of the clam bags. I said, I need to pay you for those clams. I'm busy right now. I'll talk to you later. So I left. About a week later I went back in there again. I said, I need to pay you for those clams. He said, you know, I'm just really busy right now. He was trying to tell me they were mine. Ah. <laughs> and he wouldn't give me a price. 
<laughs> but that's just what he wanted to. That's nice. But uh, but he was a nice man. Yeah. So you might say that the uniforms and the trips were the result of a lot of clam bakes and shrimp burgers. Yeah, we, yeah. Well, actually, it was clam bakes. We really did. We we probably we probably could have been in the world's book of records for the clams we sold. Because I mean, we had a lot of clams. Because you, you go out and you buy 1,500 chickens. Think about cleaning 1,500 chickens. Think about cleaning all those clams. Yeah. That's a lot of clams. That was Potatoes. A lot, that was a lot of parents helping. Yeah, and we had people working in, in Smyrna. We had them working at East. We had them working all over the place. Each place would have a job to clean chickens or to clean clams or whatever they had to do. They had to clean all that stuff, bag it up, and then we had to put them together. And then we had to cook them. At the clam house. At the clam house. And then where did you actually have the event? At East Carter. And then one one time the burner broke down, so we were a little bit late in getting started. But uh, they waited. And they were delicious. I hate to admit it, they were delicious. Yeah. I really liked them. I'm hungry just thinking about it. But they they made a lot of those. But I can't remember all the things we made. But we tried candy was one thing. We sold a pile of candy. Probably the best candy you ever had in your life. Made a lot of money on candy, too. What, where'd you get the candy? And this lady I bought it from, and I told her that if she wanted me to sell her candy, she was not to sell it to anybody else in Carteret County during the time I was selling it. Mm -hmm. And she didn't. I mean, was it a commercial operation, or was it something? It was a special kind of candy, mm -hmm. but it was really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. It had Katie Dibs and Golden Crumbles, and uh, it was just really good. Hmm. I don't even know what those things are, but... Oh, uh, you don't. <laughs> like ribbon candy? That kind of stuff? Well, well, it, it, Katie, Katie did's are like little chocolate clusters oh. with nuts and stuff in them. Yeah. And you eat one, you got to eat another one. What got, got the parents mad is these kids would take all this candy home, and they would sit there and eat it watching TV. The parents would and the kids would. And then all of a sudden they owe me $150 for the candy. And the mamas and daddies says, where is that coming from? They ate it all in the house. Yeah. They didn't go out and sell it. They just ate it. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> but we didn't have to put any more uniforms on them. They were okay. So. Yeah, as yeah. long as they could fit in the uniforms. Yeah. So, um, well, is there anything else you'd like to add about your... your well, we were marching in... Uh, Winchester one time and the truck didn't show up and the truck had all the instruments. The parade was going to start in three minutes. There was no truck. We had no instruments. And, and, and of course, Jack Russell was in charge of getting the truck there. And he knew I had to have that truck and he knew I was going to probably kill him if he didn't get there. And what happened is some water got in the gas and the truck wouldn't crank. Oh. And they were trying to get it fixed. And Jack Russell knew what he had to do. He said, we either got to get another truck and unload this one or try to get it fixed. And he was looking at his time clock. And he had that thing worked out where he pulled up exactly as the parade started. <sighs> and we had to haul all that stuff off and run down the street. So in the nick of time, yes. you had it. <laughs>